with uh, a uh, presentation um, from um, uh, Tahire. Is that, did I pronounce it properly? Tahiri. Tahiri. Close. 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 <laughs> uh, wonder, wonderful name. It's like myself with my name, Luciano. I'm the CEO of Pi for Luciano Mercedi. And um, um, it's fantastic to, um, uh, to have um, uh, this presentation today focused on horticulture and uh, some fantastic information about the wonderful world of vegetable production. So over to you. Let's go. Hey, guys. Um, as per the introduction, my name is Tahiri. I'm one of the owners of Dickie Bill Australia. Um, I've had a lot of people in the past question where we came up with the name Dicky Bill because it sort of sounds a little bit weird. So Dicky Bill was actually my husband's father, Richard William. Therefore, they named him the business Dicky Bill because we wanted to follow on his legacy after he passed away about 20 years ago. So I'm in charge of uh, the business development component, so all your sales, your marketing, but I actually came from starting off on the farm, weeding and harvesting salads, and now I live in Brisbane, which is why I can't be on the farm today. But I thought I'll bring the farm to you guys a little bit and give you a little bit of an oversight as to what we do and some of the practices that we, to make sure, we do to make sure that we're looking after the environment as well. And then some career opportunities that you may not have thought would exist with the generic name of farmer. So everyone, you know, obviously now is not interactive, but it's just to pose the question of what do people think a farmer are, what a, what a farmer is. So basically the answer to that is if you can wear it or you can eat it, it probably involved a farmer. So there's a lot of everything in everyday life that is actually farmer related. So this is, these here are my two little boys. So they grew up on the farm as well. I hope you guys can all read everything I've got. I've tried to make it as clear as possible. So I'm just going to play a bit of a video, which is going to give you an oversight as to who Dickie Bill Australia is. <laughs> Dickieville Australia is one of the largest growers of baby leaf salad in Australia, harvesting up to 100 tonnes per week of leaves. Owned and operated by two young and ambitious directors, Ryan McLeod and Hugh Reardon, and their families. Starting with 30 acres and five staff in 2001, Dickieville Australia now farms over 900 acres with over 90 staff. 1,900 kilometres separates the two growing regions, ensuring the best possible geographical risk management. Focused on innovation and progressive farming practices and plans to be completely herbicide free within two years. Our investment in state-of-the-art harvesters has revolutionised our harvesting practices focusing on foreign matter reduction. Foreign objects removal is a huge focus and we have multiple steps in our process to eliminate potential contaminants. Product is vacuum cooled and brought down to two degrees within half an hour of harvest, resulting in superior quality and shelf life of the salads. The entire operation is under fresh care and has app certification, soon to include hearts and migration to SQF 2000. With processing facilities on both sides, salad can be triple washed within hours of harvest. Our business has complete control of the cold chain from harvest to DC. Dickie Bill Australia is committed to the vertical integration of our business, offering our partners a true paddock to plate business model and food providence. 100% Australian owned and family operated. Eat your fill of Dickie Bill. Sorry, I just pressed the wrong button there, so I'll wait for my computer to reboot up so I can get the PowerPoint presentation back. But that basically gives a little bit of an insight into what we are as farmers and what we do as a business. Um, so we grow nearly 100 tonnes of product every single week. That's a whole lot of salad. If you think of how light a leaf is, and then you, you to convert that into lots and lots and lots of bags and boxes of salad. So... 
Here you'll just see we've got an overview. This is a drone image. We use drones a lot with our farming. So this is a drone image overlooking the farm. So you can just see all the rows and rows and rows of salad there. So where do our salads grow? So once we've grown them, packed them, washed them and packed them, we actually send them on freight and they go to supermarkets. So think of your Woolworths, your Coles, your Aldi, your IGAs, your Spas, your Foodworks, all those little stores that sell bags of salad. They also go into... Um, food service, so lots of cafes. Lots of cafes will actually have Dickie Bill boxes that go into their cold rooms and they'll put Dickie Bill spinach or salad onto their plates when they're serving you up your lunch or your dinner. Uh, HelloFresh, I don't know if any of you have heard of HelloFresh. We are the main grower and packer for their salads that go into their boxes that go out weekly. We also export a lot of salads. So we actually export to Singapore, Hong Kong, over into Indonesia and New Zealand. We've also looked at opportunities in Dubai. Um, so there's a lot of our salads actually on shelves in supermarkets overseas, which is pretty exciting. And then we also go into commercial kitchens. So guys that make pastries. So when you buy a pastry at the supermarket or a quiche, the Dickie Bill salad may have actually gone into that quiche. So places that make sandwiches that then put them into the service stations, that could be Dickie Bill salad that you've got in your sandwich and then dips and smoothies as well. So this is just another beautiful photo of some of our red coral. So these are all taken on the farm. So we, we basically, like I said, it's from our paddock onto your plate. So it's where your food comes from. Now, this here, this here is a little bit of a, a funny video that we made a couple of years ago now. So the boys are all a little bit younger, but it was around trying to provide a really young group with a bit of understanding on how food is grown. So we took the Easter bunny and we took Easter eggs and we sort of had a little bit of a play with that. So I'll let you watch this video. It's a good laugh, if nothing else. So I know it's not Easter time, but I think that gives a really simple picture or a simple viewpoint on how you actually grow produce. You have to plant it. You have to water it. You have to weed it. And then we look to harvest it. And that's when it then gets sent on so that you guys can buy it and you guys can eat it. Obviously, let's be real, Easter eggs don't actually grow underneath salad. But imagine if they did. So right here, I've got a bit of a flow chart that shows you a bit of the life of the spinach cycle. So it's very similar to the video that you've just watched. So we do all the ground preparation here. All right, we get the tractors out, massive, massive tractors, and we have to disc up the ground. We have to make garden beds in our paddocks so that we can be ready to plant the seed. So then we have to plant the spinach seed. But we plant spinach, we plant lots of different lettuces, we plant cos lettuce, we even plant corn. So we plant the seed. Then we have to irrigate it. We have to irrigate and fertilise. So we have to put nutrients into that soil to make sure that that plant grows as nutrient dense and as tough and strong as it possibly can so that when you eat it, it's really, really good. 
Then we go through and we weed it, just like you saw in that video, like weeds grow up in the salad. So we actually manually have to, these guys get out and they pull the weeds out of these rows. Now, some of our rows are over 2.3 kilometres long. So it takes a long time to weed from one end to the other. Then we move through to the harvest, which I'll show you some videos shortly on harvesting the salad. And we need to make sure we harvest just the salad and not the dirt that's underneath. So then we go, how is salad harvested? Now, if you watch these two very short videos here, you'll see. But right here, this is our harvester. Now, these we got made specifically for us in the USA, in the Salinas Valley, which is known to be one of the best salad growing regions in the world. So these harvesters were made over there because these guys really know what they're doing. So this here is like a big circular knife. So this goes round at a fast pace and it then pushes the cut leaves up the belt, which then go up into an auger and into the bins over here. So if we watch the video, you'll get to see that happen. And here's a drone view once again. We love our drones. So we've got a drone image there just showing the harvester and that tractor and chaser bin over here having to drive together. So those drivers need to communicate a lot to each other because otherwise one race is ahead of the other. So now we go on to the spinach life cycle continued because obviously now we've harvested the spinach, but what happens to it after we've harvested it? So we have to do a heap of quality checks on the product. We have to make sure that it doesn't have a heap of insect holes or that it doesn't have a heap of dirt on it, that it's the right size because the supermarkets and everyone, they want it to be 100 mils, so 10 centimetres. So we need to make sure that all of our salad is inside the specs that they need. Then we send it through to the wash. So it goes into a big bath. Now I've got a bit of a video on what the bath looks like, but it actually gets washed three times. So it's called triple washed because it goes through three different baths with a sanitizing agent called Tsunami. Now Tsunami is very, very safe and it makes sure that any bacteria or any grime that's on those leaves gets, gets knocked off, okay? So then we go through to the packing which we've got massive, massive weigh heads that weigh out the salage and we'll pack into 30 gram bags. We'll pack into 60 gram bags, 120 gram bags, one and a half kilo boxes, even seven kilo crates. So these weigh heads, can, we can tell them what weight we want them to put into whatever vessel they're being put into and they'll actually weigh it off correctly. So then it goes through to dispatch. So this is all under refrigeration. All salad must be kept refrigerated. So if you get your salad and you don't put it in the fridge, you're not doing the right thing by it. It won't taste as amazing as it could and it won't last as long. So all of our, all our washroom facility is under refrigeration. So then it goes on to trucks and it gets freighted to supermarkets, to HelloFresh, to farmers markets, to fruit shops gets freighted to restaurants and cafes. It goes everywhere it needs to be so that everyone can eat salad. So this is a little bit of a video on the salad getting washed. So this is that it comes out of one bath and just gets dropped into the second bath. So I've put it in slow motion for you so you can see that water pooling around at the bottom as it swirls the salad to make sure that it's clean. And the water's all cold water too to make sure that the salad stays nice and cold. And that variety there, that's called a mescaline or a salad mix. So it's actually got lots of different varieties of salad. So we actually have to harvest all the red ones, all the red coral in there. We harvest those into bins in one go. Then we'll harvest the green coral into bins in one go. And then the guys in the washroom, the guys in the processing factory, they actually have to mix it. So they've got like a recipe that they have to follow that puts all the right amount of the green, the wild rocket, the spinach, the red coral, all into the tub so that when it goes through the bath, it comes out looking uniformly beautiful like that. Now this here, this is just a beautiful photo of one of the farm and the one of the tractors on the farm. So it's just a magical stormy photo, this one. But the size of that tractor, if you imagine you guys are in grade five or six, I think, 
So you wouldn't even make it up to the wheel. If you look at the middle axle, the centre of those wheels, your heads probably wouldn't get above there. That's how big that tractor is. So you would actually be shorter than this here. Those tractors are massive. So with us farming, we were very, very conscious of the fact that we want to make sure that we look after the environment while we're doing it because, you know, farming's come a very, very long way from where it used to. So we, there's lots of practices that we have on the farm to improve our soil health, improve our crop health and make sure that we can continue farming for the future. So healthy soil here equals healthy produce. So the better we look after our farms and our soil means that the produce you're getting is more nutrient dense. So to improve our soil health and increase our worm activity, we concentrate on minimising soil disturbance on maximising crop diversity. So we make sure we don't grow the same crop in the same spot every single time because that will just pull too many nutrients out of the ground. So we have to swap around what we do. Now, I know the video said that we had 900 acres. We've actually now got 1,200 acres of farming country between those two locations in Victoria and Queensland. So that's a lot of country that we grow a lot of salad on. So we also like to keep the soil covered so generally we've got a crop on there or in summer in Queensland we grow cover crops. So we actually keep the, the top of the soil covered so we don't lose that top soil. We also maintain living root in the ground for a minimum of 300 days per year. By having plant roots growing in the soil and increasing the worm activity, we're improving the soil quality and we minimise the herbicide and pesticide use. Now we do need to use a few pesticides. Now pesticides are the things that stop the bugs, you know, but we also make a lot of practices, which I'll go into just shortly, around reducing bug activity by not using pesticides. So we use things that other than sprays to get rid of bugs as well. So reef rescue. In 2008, the federal government committed $200 million towards improving water quality into the Great Barrier Reef. And we were lucky enough to be a part of this. So we got some funding from this. So we got to upgrade our spraying equipment, which significantly reduced the volume of runoff. Now, runoff's the stuff that doesn't end up on the product. So it's the things, the, the water and the spray that ends up in the wheel tracks, which then can end up in your riverways. And we don't want that. So we got a complete upgrade of our equipment to minimise the use of that. And I've just posed a questionnaire that you can probably think about after this of how you could reduce the waste and water rubbish going into the ocean. Now, there's lots of things you can think of. And one of the things that my kids discuss a lot is the fact that if they take shorter showers, that in itself can reduce the amount of waste and rubbish going into the ocean. So here we are on pest management. So pest management, we, we recognise that there are bad bugs and then there are good bugs. So we want to encourage the growth of good bugs. So we've implemented a robust integrated pest management strategy because we want to make sure that we keep the good bugs that actually eat the bad bugs, we want to keep them alive. So we use chemicals that don't harm the insects that are good. So... Well, we, some of the sprays we use, they're called soft sprays and they can be sprayed and they won't kill the ladybugs because ladybugs, they eat aphids. We don't like aphids, but we love ladybugs. So we don't want to hurt the ladybugs. And we also buy insects in. Funnily enough, you can actually buy insect larvae in. There's businesses that sell insect larvae. So you can see in the picture here, this one is called a trichogramma. Now, it helps control pests like the heliothus and other caterpillars that come in and want to, they want to eat our corn, they want to eat our salads, and they want to eat other crops that we grow. So we buy these ones in and they'll go along and they'll actually eat the eggs of all the bad bugs. So that's pretty cool to be able to grow, to buy bugs to save having to use chemicals as much as we can. Something else that people often don't think of as being a pest with salad are ducks. So everyone always thinks of snails, they think of slugs, they think of caterpillars. But for farmers of salad, so us, the duck is a big, big problem. So a flock of ducks can fly in at night time and they can eat up to a thousand kilos of cos in one night. So in the paddock, 
they just go along and they mow it down. They just chew, 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 chew. So it costs us a lot of money in crops that we can't harvest then, that we can't feed people with because the ducks have come in and ate it all. So we've actually come up with a solution called a duck laser. So the duck laser is positioned on top of our shed in the middle of the farm and we can program that duck laser to actually shoot a laser beam across the farm. It'll be something for you to talk about with your teachers when you go, why don't birds like light beams? Because birds don't like light beams. If you take a laser beam light and you shine it in front of a bird, it will actually fly away. So we've put this technology into practice on the farm. Now, if you watch this video very, very carefully, because obviously it's very dark on this screen here, you might be lucky enough just to see, I've managed to capture the duck laser shooting across the screen as I've videoed it. And that's all it is, is a duck laser shooting across the farm to make sure that it gets any ducks that have settled and scares them away. Hopefully you all saw that one and it'll come back in a moment. And there it goes again. So it's very hard to see that one, but that's how simple it is. So as I mentioned earlier, we use drones a lot. Drones are a fantastic tool. I cannot drive them. I do not know how to fly a drone. I would probably crash it and they're worth a lot of money, so I'm not allowed to fly them. So Digibill is at the forefront of integrating technology into commercial vegetable growing. Our drones fly over the crops, as you'll see in this video that's playing just here, they fly over the crops multiple times a week. So there's multi-spectral cameras, so cameras that capture the tiniest change in colour. We, they use the entire band of light and they monitor the density and the chlorophyll levels of our crops. So they can tell us how much chlorophyll is in one section of spinach on the farm compared to another section. It's pretty fascinating. We then cross-reference the data received with yield cameras that we use on the harvesters. So we know what we should be expected to get as a yield and we can cross-check it to make sure that we improve our quality and improve our efficiencies. Now we're on to cover crops. So I mentioned that we use cover crops because we like to have the paddocks with at least 300 days of roots in the ground. So that's where cover crops come in a lot. And they also work in the events that here up in Queensland, we get a lot of flooding over summer. So summer's our off season, but summer's also when Queensland traditionally gets a lot of rain. So as you'll see in the photo here, in 2013, in January, the Bundaberg region experienced the biggest flood in its history. So there were houses that were float, they floated off their stumps. There were houses that were completely underwater. It was a monstrous flood. And we were actually living on the farm at the time. So the river was 22 metres above the weir. Now a weir is like a wall used to stop the flow of the river or to slow the flow of the river. So if it's 22 metres above that, that's how much water was going through. Like there's a lot of water. You think how far 22 metres is and how deep that would be. So my husband, Ryan, he could actually drive a boat across our entire farm. You couldn't see any of the sprinklers and you couldn't see any of the ground. That's how much it flooded. So what we, you know, part of that, we put a cover crop in and the cover crop actually protected us from losing all our topsoil during this flood. Because when the flood waters subsided, we still had our cover crop. It was very damaged, but it had held, all those root systems had held the topsoil in place, which is really important. So as part of our soil regeneration program, we plant a cover crop of Sudan grass every off season. So it not only returns organic carbon into the soil, but it encourages greater worm activity. And then, like I said, means that we don't lose our topsoil. Another way that we make sure we're looking after our soil is through crop rotation. Now, I mentioned just before that we don't want to be growing the same crops over and over again in the same section of ground because sustainability is a number one priority for us. So as a farming business, we need to look after our crops and our soil for future generations. So we rotate the types of vegetables grown throughout the season as they all have nutritional needs. 
plus it reduces the pest pressure. So we can reduce the amount of those bad bugs just by planting something different that those bad bugs don't eat. So we stale seed bed and we to germinate the reeds and the crops. Now, what that means is we make the beds up. I'll show you in the next photo here. So we make these beds up, all right, and then we irrigate them. So before we plant anything in them, we actually turn the sprinklers on and we make sure we water them. So any tiny little weeds that have seeds in these beds, they grow. Then we use a gas burner. So we use a, an implement that goes on the back of the hub, on back of the tractor and it's got gas flames. So instead of using herbicide, we can actually burn the weeds. Now, after we've burnt the weeds, that's when we can plant our vegetable seeds. That's when we can plant our salad seeds. We also made sure we went to bigger tractors. Now, once again, this is one of these massive, massive tractors. Now, the tractor wheels are normally back in here, but we got all of our tractors modified to be bigger because if the bigger we can make these beds, the less wheel tracks, which means more farming country. It means that there's more irrigation going on to farming country. We don't want to water the wheel tracks. We want to water the beds. We want to water the salad. It means there's less fuel because we don't, every time we go up, we get three of these massive beds as opposed to only getting one. So we don't have to use as much diesel in the tractors going up and down, up and down. That pretty much brings me to the conclusion of what I wanted to sort of cover off today. You'll see here, here's just some of the produce and some of the end products that we actually sort of, that salad ends up in. And the photo behind it is a beautiful photo of the farm that was taken. Um, so back over to you, Luciano, to Wonderful. fire away some, with some questions. Wow. That's just, uh, it, it, it really blows my mind that there's so much technology involved in the production of uh of, of salad greens that's uh, that's just amazing to think that you know when you buy the product in the supermarket you've got no idea exactly how it actually got there and that's a great that's a great presentation to give us that background that's just amazing and this is a great opportunity for any of the uh, the classrooms logging in today or teachers uh, to ask any questions if you've got some questions please um, put them in the chat area and um, and uh, I, I, this is a great opportunity to ask some some interesting questions because um, I, I think this yeah uh, the the food production that you're involved in Tahiri is just uh, amazing and uh, and really think about the amount of food that we need to feed people in Australia and you think about it you know we we need more than just a backyard of vegetables we need thousands of acres of vegetables to meet the needs of um, of, of the uh, of people and supermarkets and all those retailers so that that's a huge job isn't it it, it it's a very big job and some days it gives me more headaches than others <laughs> but look we still smile i think that's our motto that we have we still smile one thing i want to flag with everyone is everyone often thinks of a farmer and i reckon the majority of people watching think of a farmer with an akubra hat on and a shirt out in the paddock but as you've seen, I've actually brought the farm to you here from my office here in Brisbane because I don't live on the farm anymore. I used to and I absolutely loved it. But on the farm, we've got electricians, we've got engineers, we've got boilermakers, we've got professionals in food production and manufacturing, machine operators and computer guys that have to run those bagging lines to pack off the salads, tractor drivers, you know, I think I said mechanics. You move into it. I'm in sales. I'm in business development. So that's not on the farm. That's not your typical, typical of Cobra wearing person. We've got an accounting team. We've got buddy. Uh, so excuse me. We've got a HR guy who employs people because we have 120 staff that we need to employ. So at any given time, we need to be filling positions. We own our own trucks. So we've got truck drivers. The opportunities in a farming enterprise are absolutely amazing. They're huge and I need people to understand that a farmer is not just someone standing in a paddock growing something. There's so much more involved in actually getting that product from our farm to you guys. That's that's a really, a really important point you just made there. 
and really the 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 the, the number of uh, skilled people that are required to run a farm like yours is is huge and uh, it's not just about like you say the old man uh, with his Akubra on the on the tractor it's it's really agriculture and horticulture in this case has has come such a long way in the last 40 to 50 years and um it's it's amazing how many opportunities there are, and and especially in your, your industry right now, there's a real great need for uh, for people to work in uh, in horticulture, isn't there? Absolutely, there's there's a massive work shortage across the entire industry, both agriculture and horticulture at the moment. I mean, we we relied pre-COVID, we relied heavily on the backpackers. Um, obviously, with them, not there's not free international travel just yet, so. We've had nearly two years where we've had to think outside the box and find other ways of recruiting staff. So there's been many, many hats that we've had to put on over the last couple of years to get us through what's been, you know, this this pandemic. So but throughout all that, our key driver is the fact that everyone still needs to eat. So we still need to produce our salads and our corn to make sure that we're providing food for the population to eat. Exactly. And look, looking at all the technology that you use on your uh, properties, uh, it really shows that there's a great need for specialised um, labour in terms of um, uh, specialised individuals who know how to manage and, and maintain all that technology that you've got because it, it plays such an important role in, the, in your ability to grow and produce all of your crops. Absolutely. The guys that run our machinery, I look, I wouldn't know how to do it. I struggled to get technology to work with me to get onto this meeting to be able to pre present in the first place. Whereas we've got guys who absolutely love their technology and they're basically working on big computers in our processing facility. You know, they're telling the computer what they wanted to do and that then is producing a bag of salad at whatever specification they're wanting it to come out at the end. So we've got a lot of um, sort of very generic work. You know, there's the weeding, there's packing into boxes and everything else. That will always have to be done. But there is definitely a lot of specialised positions as well. Even those harvesters, like the harvester that's photo here, that's actually a $500,000 harvester. So you have to be very, very skilled to be allowed to drive it because we can't afford to break it. So it, there's there's just massive massive opportunities. I I I don't see any questions yet, but I, I'm really excited about this. I've got to ask you one more question. So I see it harvesting uh, the um, uh, the crop there. So yep. does it only harvest one crop off that lot of plants? Some of the products that we grow, we only get one harvest off. Other products, we can go back and we can actually regrow the crop. So a lot of the inputs. So a lot of the cost is actually in getting it to this first crop. So once, you know, this first cut that we've got going on. So once we've harvested it, there are products like Wild Rocket, some of our spinach will regrow and some of our lettuces as well, where we can actually, after we've harvested, we go back through and we provide more nutrients and more fertiliser onto that product to encourage it to regrow. And then we can harvest it again. So then in, in some of the crops we can harvest multiple times. We, we actually grow herbs as well um, and mint. I don't know if anyone grows mint at home, but you basically can't kill it. So we harvest it, yep. then we mulch it back into the beds and then it regrows. And then weeks later we harvest it again and then we mulch it again and then it regrows because you can't kill mint. <laughs> No, no, you can't. It's uh, it, it, I, I've got it growing everywhere in my garden as well. Um, uh, and and one more question about um, uh, water. Where do you get your water from to irrigate your crops? And and what sort of irrigation do you use? Sure. So our water, part of when we were looking for which farming country we wanted to be on, the key factors for us were soil type and irrigation, so the water capacities, because we use water to grow salads. So we found the two locations, one in Queensland and one in Victoria, because that provides us with the 12 month supply. But the key element there is we needed significant water security. 
So in Queensland, that water security comes from what's called the IWS Water Scheme. So it's an irrigation scheme that was set up for sugarcane farming. So it's massive, massive pipes under the ground from the dams that actually pipe water across the entire region. So when we started setting up farm, because all the sprinklers, like you can just see them in the photos, all those sprinklers, we actually, like I glued those sprinklers onto the pipes when we first started. So we did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres. So underneath the ground on this entire farm is just an absolute network of water. That all comes back to a main shed, the shame shed that's got the duck laser on it. And inside that shed is a Netafim irrigation system. Now, it looks like a Christmas tree. There are just so many solenoids on that, on that tree. And each solenoid equals one row of sprinklers. And that, once again, it's a big computer. So you tell that computer when you want to turn the water on, how long you want to water for. And then we've also got big tanks with all the fertiliser. You know, we use a, a sea sole, which is like a seaweed combination. We use calcium. We use lots of different fertilisers. And the computer system actually takes it from the tank and injects it into the water as it's sending it out into the sprinklers. So while we're sprinkling, we're providing nutrients for our product all through big pipes that go the entire way underneath the water, um, underneath the ground. Wow, that's that's really complex. And, and again, you need some specialised people to monitor and manage all of that. So there's there's so many components to to making uh, or producing your crops. And uh, it, it sounds uh, it sounds like an amazing organisation that you have there. And um, it's uh, it's a, uh, your presentation is a great insight into uh, into your business and into the production of uh, of your crops, which is which is amazing. Um, I, we've we've come to the end of our presentation today, and I really want to uh, thank you for your insight through your presentation. It's really an amazing world out there, and when you think about it, uh, a simple bag of um, lettuce leaves is um, it, it has come a long way to uh to the supermarket and you've provided us with a great insight today so really Thank appreciate you. your time today Thank and you. um appreciate uh, all the um all the schools that have logged in today uh, this presentation will be available as a recording on the um, primary industries education foundation youtube channel uh, from monday next week so thank you all for joining us today and uh, being part of national ag week here at uh, primary industries education foundation thanks everybody Take care. Thanks so much for your presentation.